as I told you, I'm going to be talking on a topic that wouldn't be classified as feel-good preaching, which is what we see in a lot of churches, particularly the mega churches and what they call seeker-sensitive churches, where they try to appeal to what people want to hear, feel-good preaching. And a lot of the preaching you'll hear today is just motivational speaking, covered with Christian language. If you listen to it, you can't necessarily fault it, but um, you'll find that they just talk about how God wants to bless you and do good things for you and give you cool things. Okay, and you don't hear anything about hell or about sin, about God's justice. And you talk about things that are positive. Why is that the case? That in order to fill churches, you have to preach like that? Well, there's different reasons why preachers do that. One is that they are hirelings, what Jesus referred to. Not the good shepherd. They don't have their eye on the they've got their eye on the congregation's wallets and not on their souls. They want large tithes, so we've got to be careful not to offend the tithers, chase them away. Perhaps they want to be liked and popular, so they give the people what they want. Jesus said that there was a sign of a false prophet, that all men speak well of them. But the true prophets, they treated badly because they didn't like their message. Perhaps it's because they don't really love the people. Because if you truly love someone, you don't only tell them good things. You would warn them. Tough love. Perhaps they get their theology from TV or from a preacher, but not from the Bible. And it's a problem with a lot of the messages today is that they come from TV or they've been Googled or maybe using chat GPT. Or maybe the preacher himself doesn't really believe that the wages of sin is death and that hell is a place where souls burn eternally and that God is really going to judge the unrepentant sinner. You know, he's just bluffing to scare you into being good. Perhaps they want to build up their own kingdom rather than the kingdom of God. They want to fill seats. The pretext of being inspirational and caring. And so there you can see the largest mega church in America. Notice how full it is. And the preacher at that church admits that he focuses on optimism. And he says, People have been beaten down enough by life by the time they go to church on Sundays. And his aim is to leave, for people to leave inspired. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. It's good to inspire people, and people are beaten down and need encouragement. But if that's all you've got to say, and you skip over what the Bible says on sin, righteousness, and judgment, then that's not only a half gospel, it's a false gospel. Sometimes the case is that those who preach are not saved themselves. They don't preach the true gospel because they were never saved, or they were saved, inverted commas, by hearing a false gospel, the gospel that purpose in life is that God wants to just bless you, and that's why we get saved, so that you can be blessed and rich and wear nice shoes and top watch and designer clothes. So this wouldn't probably be preached on in a church like we saw earlier, or most churches today, a topic on hell. Is hell for real? C.S. Lewis, the well-known Christian apologist who was an Oxford professor, was a Cambridge, wrote many good books, said there's no doctrine which I would more willingly remove from Christianity than this, if it lay in my power. But it has the full support of scripture and especially of our Lord's own words. It has always been held by Christendom and it has the support of reason. If a game is played, it must be possible to lose it. And if you don't know this, the one who spoke the most about hell in the Bible was Jesus, more than anyone else. And God question says, Jesus taught that hell is a real place where some beings will spend eternity. 
in Jesus' teaching, hell is not figurative or symbolic. It is a real place in which real experiences take place. Jesus portrayed what hell is like with vivid imagery, such as fire and darkness. Now, in our English Bibles, we have got different words from the Greek that are rendered as hell, which sometimes does cause a bit of confusion. And you've had teaching on this before, but I just want to remind you that one of the words in the New Testament that's translated as hell is Hades. And Hades is not the final hell. It's the interim dwelling place for the wicked death, the one that Jesus spoke about when he talked about the rich man and Lazarus. That's Hades. And so I'm going to use them fairly interchangeably, but I will mention, because there's a lot of similarities in them, in the interim place and the final place. And there's also Gehenna, which is the final lake of fire, which Jesus also spoke about in the book of Revelation. It calls it the lake of fire. And then there's Tartarus. It's only used once in 2 Peter 2, 4, but it is rendered in most English versions as hell, but it's actually a totally different word uh, in the Greek, and it's only once in the New Testament. And we believe, without going into details on that, that that's actually referring to the abyss where the fallen angels, and that's the fallen angels of Genesis 6, not anything to do with Satan's rebellion. rebellion. The fallen angels of Genesis 6 are bound there and kept in chains of darkness until judgment. And that's what's referred to in 2 Peter 2.4. So it says hell there, but that's not Hades or Vienna. It's a different place. So what did Jesus say about hell? Today I'm just going to tell you what was said in terms of description of hell. And next time I'll speak on what the Bible says about those who will end up there. But Hades was the Greek word for the realm of the dead. And Jesus used it more specifically to refer to a place of torment and a place that is the opposite of heaven. The word Giena, the name originally came from the Hinnom Valley, south of Jerusalem. And that is where centuries earlier they practiced child sacrifice. But by the time of Jesus, Giena was used of hell. And there are some people who try to tell you what uh, you argue against hell will say, well, Guiana was just the rubbish dump in Jerusalem where they burnt things. And, um, you know, they like to think that because of that, hell's not a real place. Now, it's true that the word did come from that, but there's no evidence for the common assertion that the city's refuse was burnt in the Valley of Gien at the time of Jesus. It's one of these things that everybody cites it and everybody quotes each other, but there's actually no evidence that they actually burnt rubbish in Gien. So it does mean the Valley of Hinnom. And so where did this imagery come from? Well, there's only one clear reference in the book of Jeremiah 7, verse 31 to 32, where he says they have built the high places of Topheth in the valley of Ben Hinnom, that's where Giena got its name from, to burn their sons and daughters in the fire. So it was a place where they were, as part of their pagan worship, burning their sons and daughters, child sacrifice. And because of that, the judgment with the Babylonians coming was going to be in response to that. So beware, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the people will no longer call it Topheth or the Valley of Ben Hinnom, but the Valley of Slaughter, for they will bury the dead in Topheth until there's no more room. So notice though, he doesn't say they'll burn them, they were buried. The Jews didn't practice cremation. Um, that's something that came from the Vikings and some European cultures, not practiced by the Jews even today, by the Orthodox. So they were buried. The ones who were burning the children in the valley of Hinnom were those who were engaged in pagan worship. So the point that I'm trying to make is the fact that the word Gehenna event, uh, came from um, the valley of Hinnom doesn't mean that it was not a real place because Jesus spoke about it as being a place where God can destroy both body and soul. Now, you don't destroy souls in the Jerusalem garbage dump. And so 
the reference to fires in the Valley of Hinnom, if you research it, and to burning corpses there was only made in 1200 AD, very late, by a rabbi in his commentary on Psalm 27. So I just want to read this to you. G.R. Beasley Murray says, the notion that the city's rubbish was burned in this valley has no further basis than a statement by the Jewish scholar David Kimhi, made about 1200 AD. It is not attested in any ancient source. David Kimi, a medieval rabbi, wrote in his commentary on Psalm 27. This is what a Jewish rabbi wrote in 1218. That's not in the time of Jesus. Gehenna is a repugnant place into which filth and cadavers, that's a corpse, are thrown, and in which fires perpetually burn in order to consume the filth and bones, on which account, by analogy, the judgment of the wicked is called Gehenna. And that idea has been pulled into common popular theology to try to say, well, it's not really a real place. It was the garbage dump in Jerusalem. Got its name from that, but Jesus spoke, as I said, of it being a place where God can destroy the soul. And so here's some story that Jesus told, not a parable, we'll see, about hell. This is Hades, the waiting place. That's the word he uses there, not Guiana. And he spoke about it as being a place where there's a consciousness out of the body, not soul sleep. And he said there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried in hell, it's Hades, the waiting place, where he was in torment. He looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me. And send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, because I am in agony in this fire. But Abram replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. Notice how vividly Jesus is describing this place. Doesn't sound to me like the Jerusalem garbage dump. He answered, then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abram replied, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abram, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. And so those who are uncomfortable with that particular story will not preach on it too much. And if they do, they will tell you it's a parable. But it's different to parables. If you go look at all the other parables of Jesus, and there are many, he never uses proper names like Lazarus. He would say things like a certain nobleman, uh, a sower went out, um, a farmer, a man, a woman never uses names. The other thing is that it's totally the opposite of what a parable is. A parable was a mechanism where a spiritual truth would be communicated by using a physical truth. So because spiritual truths are hard to grasp, a grasp um, Jesus would tell them about things they could understand, a fisherman catching fish, a farmer sowing, and they could relate to that. And then you would say, well, the kingdom of God's like that. So what physical thing could he be speaking about in that story when he's talking about a place of the departed dead he's not talking about anything physical 
So it's not a parable. It's clearly not a story about a physical earthly event that anyone could relate to. It should not be classified as a parable, and it isn't. The Seventh-day Adventists will tell you that when you die, you have soul sleep. There's no consciousness, in other words. This is what they say. Um, humans are an indivisible unity of body, mind, and spirit. So they don't see us as being a tripod being. They say when your brain stops functioning, everything packs up. Like the materialists tell as well. They do not possess an immortal soul, and there's no consciousness after death. And we refer to that as soul sleep. It's not a biblical teaching. It's not only held by the Seventh-day Adventists, it's also taught by the Jehovah's Witnesses, which is a cult, as are the Christadelphians and the various different churches of God, which all came originally from Herbert W. Armstrong. He used to have that magazine, The Plain Truth. And my dad always used to say that the only plain truth about that was that it wasn't the plain truth. Jesus is teaching that hell is a place where there is consciousness, if you read that particular passage in Luke. Because the rich man could see. It's part of consciousness. He could see Abram and Lazarus. He could speak. He called out to Abram, but he died, we are told. It's the man who's dead. He could hear because he heard Abram's reply. This was without the benefit of his body. He could feel he was in agony. Consciousness. He could remember. So the memories were there because he recognizes Lazarus. Say, hey, that's the guy who used to sit at my gate that I ignored. He remembered that he had a father and five brothers. His memories were there. And yet some people will tell you that your memories solely reside in your brain. So strictly speaking, if your brain stops functioning, you should have no memories. In fact, Abram actually appealed to his memory of a misspent life. He says to him, remember, in your lifetime you receive good things. He appeals to his memory. And so, memories will be there for eternity. Remembering all the lost opportunities in this case will add to the suffering. He could also reason because he wanted to warn his brothers. But Abram made it clear that you need to heed the Bible when you're alive if you don't want to have a similar fate. He said, please send back Lazarus to warn them. And Abram said, if they don't believe the scripture, if they don't believe Moses and the prophets, the Bible, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. And that was the case, by the way, with another man called Lazarus. If you read in the book of John, where Jesus raised a man from the dead, rather than the skeptics believing, the guys like the Sadducees, who said there's no resurrection, their plan was then to kill Lazarus and Jesus because he was an embarrassment to their theology, which said there's no resurrection. And so if Abraham said that we need to look at what the Bible teaches, and if we're not going to listen to it, we're not going to listen to even someone who comes back from the dead or be convinced by that, let's see what the Bible does teach about hell. Firstly, it's a place to be feared. And this comes from Jesus, and he should have known. He said, I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after the killing of the body has power to throw you into hell. That's Gehenna there, by the way. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Hebrews 10 verse 26 to 31 gives us a warning. And it says, if we deliberately keep on sinning, after we've received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. For we know him who said it is mine to avenge, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands 
of the living God. Hell is a place to be feared. It's spoken of as being a place of torment. And in Matthew chapter 8, when we have the demon-possessed man and the demon speaking through him, and they thought that their time had come, they say to Jesus, what do you want with us, Son of God? Have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? They expected torment. Revelation 20.10 says the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the beast, that's the Antichrist, and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. A place of torment is what the Bible talks about, whether you like it or not. And in the account that we read about the rich man earlier, Jesus said in hell where he was in torment. The rich man says, I'm in agony. And he says, let them warn them so they will not also come to this place or let him warn them to this place of torment. Then it's spoken of as being a place of separation from God. 2 Thessalonians 1, 9 to 10 speaks about the wicked who will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of his power. And so in the sheep goat judgment, we find that the king says to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed. Depart from me, separation from God. Andrew Nassali, who is a biblical professor, has said that it is a reality, the separation from God, that we can't relate to immediately on earth because even unbelievers experience God's blessings, even though it's unknowingly. Even the atheist experienced God's blessing. Jesus said that. Jesus said that God causes his son to rise on the evil and the good. And you'll notice when it rains, and it rains on your house. It's not that there's no rain on your neighbor who's an atheist or a Muslim. Okay, God sends his son and the rain on the righteous and the righteous and uh, unrighteous. In Luke 6 30, uh, 35, it says, God is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. And why? Because in Romans 2, verse 4, it says that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. So even the ungodly do not fully experience separation from God's love while they are alive here on earth. But in hell, the separation from God, left without access to the love, hope, peace, and the other blessings that some people unknowingly receive from a benevolent creator. And then sorrow and regret. You see, with the rich man, he's regretting the choices he had made that led him to hell as his final destination. And um, Dante Alighieri, the well-known Italian author in the Middle Ages, wrote a fictional work called The Inferno, where he talks about the seven circles of hell, I think it is. And it is a fictional work, but his inscription at the gate of hell is abandon all hope, ye who enter ye, quite sobering and yet very true description. Because Jesus often used the word, and I'll show you, gnashing, gnashing of teeth, which according to Strong's means biting or grinding. Okay, just the sound of it sounds terrible, but it talks about someone who's in agony. In Matthew 8, verse 12, he speaks about those who will be thrown into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Weeping, that's sorrow, gnashing of teeth, agony, regret. And just to show you how many times Jesus yeah, speaks indirectly of hell. So besides the times he speaks directly about Hades and Guiana, he often speaks indirectly and he uses the same symbolism so the wicked lazy servant the end of that parable we are told that they cast the worthless servant into outer darkness in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth 
the unfaithful servant. Remember the one who didn't use the talent, single talent. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place to the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When he speaks about the dragnet and he explains that it's a picture of the angels coming at the end of the world. And as the fishermen separate the good from the bad fish, he says the angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. Same analogy. But he says in that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Parable of the tears. Remember the wheat and the tears? The tears are the ones of which it is said, they will throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Notice that the symbolism, the fire, the weeping, the gnashing of teeth, repeatedly used by Jesus. The man without the wedding garments who came, but he hadn't been properly attired. The king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot, take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so it's an analogy that Jesus uses repeatedly as he tries to warn people about the horrors of hell. He spoke of hell as outer darkness. The oldest book in the Bible is believed to be Job. And this is what Job has to say, which we believe is an allusion to hell. In Job 10, verse 21 to 22, a place of darkness and loneliness. Before I go to the place of no return, to the land of gloom and utter darkness, to the land of deepest night, of utter darkness and disorder, where even the light is like darkness. And so hell's not a place where you're going to be partying with your friends, as some people like to jovially tell you. When you speak to them about hell, they'd rather go to hell because they're going to be with all their friends and having a party. Well, it's a place of darkness and suffering. 2 Peter 2 verse 17 says, These men are springs without water and mists driven by a storm. Blackest darkness is reserved for them. Place of fire. Now, people debate as to whether the fire is literal or not. Well, it sounds pretty literal when Jesus is speaking about the rich man and Lazarus. And Jesus mentioned fire repeatedly. In fact, he mentions it with relation to hell at least 27 times. Father Abraham, the rich man says, send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water, cool my tongue, because I'm in agony in this fire. Why does he ask for water? Matthew 5.22, Jesus says, whoever says, this is to his brother, you fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. The tears, Jesus said in Matthew 13, verse 42, are gathered and burnt in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. Matthew 13, 42, they will cast them into the furnace of fire. I've mentioned some others there as well, which for the sake of time we won't go into and we've already ref referenced them elsewhere. Revelation 20, 10 says, the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur. You'd think if the intention is just to convey suffering, they could come up with some other analogies, but it seems the analogy is always the same. Revelation 9 verse 2. Now remember this is speaking about the abyss, which is more correctly equated with Tartarus. But still, once again, there are similarities. It speaks about smoke rising from it. Remember, there's no smoke without a fire. Smoke rose from it like the smoke from a gigantic furnace. The sun and sky were darkened by the smoke from the abyss. The fallen angels are released then during the tribulation. Jesus not only used the analogy of fire, he used repeatedly um, this particular analogy, which is not a literal one. We don't literally have to pluck your eye out, but it shows how terrible um, this place is because he says, if your eye causes you to sin, 
pluck it out and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be eyes to be cast into hellfire. Now, as I say, please don't take that literally. Um, but the point he's making is it's better to be maimed and not go to hell than to enter hell with all your body parts. And he says the same about your hand. If your hand causes you to sin, he said, cut it off. It's better to have one hand and to go to hell with two hands into the fire that will never be quenched. And then in Mark 9.45, if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame rather than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched. Do you think that Jesus is trying to make a point here that hell is a bad place? He even speaks about fire when he uses more figurative warnings about the punishment of the wicked. So in Matthew 7 verse 19, he says, Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. There he is using an analogy. And the same with the vine. Remember John 15? If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is, that is, and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. Very common analogy. And so those who believe in soul sleep typically believe in what's called annihilationism. So what they say is not only does your soul sleep, they say that when you die, both the wicked and the righteous have no consciousness, despite what the Bible teaches on it. There's no knowledge, no consciousness. But then they go so far as to say that at the resurrection, the, right, the righteous, yes, they do live forever, but they say that the wicked are annihilated. And it's often linked to that doctrine. Soul sleep and annihilationism, again, you see the same suspects. The Seventh-day Adventists, Jehovah's Witness, Crystal Delphians, and the followers of Herbert Armstrong all believe in annihilationism. Very nice if it were true, but it's not. And so they believe in the doctrine of what they call conditional immortality. The Bible speaks that our soul and our spirit are immortal, whether you're righteous or not. And so conditional, conditional immortality is the idea that a human soul is not immortal unless it is given eternal life. They assert that God will eventually destroy the wicked, leaving only the righteous to live on in immortality. One of the arguments is they say that eternal torment is a disproportionate punishment. They say that you have a finite lifespan and you can only commit a finite number of sins and therefore to punish you with an infinite uh, duration is disproportionate. But the counter argument is that sin is not primarily against other people, it's against God. Psalm 51 verse 4, David says, remember he has had a man killed, he's committed adultery with his wife, and he doesn't say I've sinned against Uriah, he says against you, that's God, and you only have I sinned. Sin is against God. And so the punishment for a crime rather, we see in the Bible, is proportional to the status of the wronged individual. And because God is infinite, and his infinite dignity requires that transgression against him warrants an infinite punishment. One of the things that annihilationists claim is that when Jesus speaks about people being destroyed, that must be annihilation. Because Jesus said, we saw fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body and hell. So they say, well, if you destroyed, you're annihilated. However, that word that's used of as destroy, it can mean annihilation, but there are cases even in the Bible where it's not used of annihilation, where it means ceasing to exist in terms of you being ruined for the purpose to which you were supposed to serve. So Jesus speaks about the wine skins that burst, and he that uses the same word. 
that they destroyed. The wineskins didn't cease to exist. The point he was making is that they were no longer fit for the purpose to which they were intended. Food gone bad. Do not work for the food that perishes. If food goes bad, and the same word is used there, it doesn't mean it ceases to exist. It just means it's no longer fit for human consumption. So that word is not used exclusively in the Greek New Testament of things that are annihilated. It is sometimes used in the sense, as I've showed you, where something is just ruined for the purpose that it was supposed to serve. And that is the sense, I believe, that Jesus is speaking of there when he speaks about God destroying the soul and the body. They ruined for the purpose to which they were supposed to serve. Then another claim they'll make is that the final hell is called the second death. And so that implies total destruction. They're thrown into the lake of fire, the second death. And so they like to believe that that is total destruction. So is that what's been taught when it speaks about the second death? Are we being told that um, there is annihilation? I want to remind you that death in the Bible never means extinction, but separation. And so when you die physically, we've seen you're not annihilated. It's the separation of the body and soul and spirit. We taught in the Bible that there's still consciousness of the soul and the spirit. In the book of Revelation as well, you see the souls under the altar crying out to God for vengeance. They are conscious. They're speaking. And then remember what happened to them on earth. How long, O oh Lord, until you avenge us? Okay, so the Bible doesn't speak that death is cessation of existence. It's separation. In the case of physical death, the body and the soul and spirit are separated. Spiritual death as well is separation. Remember what Adam and Eve were told in the day you eat from the tree, you will surely die. They ate from the tree and they didn't drop dead. But what did happen? They were separated from God. Spiritual death implied separation from God, not that they ceased to exist. And so the second death is permanent separation of man from God. We saw separation from his presence. Depart from me, you who are cursed. In fact, if you believe in annihilation, why are we told that God's going to resurrect the bodies of the wicked simply then to annihilate them. So he resurrects them, judges them, and then just destroys them. Why didn't you just leave them if they didn't, they were sleeping anyway, soul sleep, and they're gonna to cease to exist? Why go to all the trouble? Because in Revelation 20, verse 5 to 15, it says the rest of the dead, that's the wicked dead, did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it, and I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Second death in the sense that these resurrected people, their bodies have been resurrected as well, are thrown bodily, as are the Antichrist and the false prophet. They're thrown body, soul and spirit into the lake of fire. And there's eternal separation from God, not annihilation. So annihilationists will also tell you, well, this idea of everlasting concept, uh, punishment is not a concept you find in the Old Testament. Well, even if it wasn't, we New Covenant Christians, so if it's taught in the New Testament, that's enough for me. But the point is they're wrong on that. Because in Daniel 12 verse 2, it says multiple uh, multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Everlasting contempt. Isaiah spoke of everlasting burning for the godless. In chapter 33, verse 14, the sinners in Zion are terrified. Trembling grips the godless. Who of us can dwell with the consuming fire? Who of us can dwell with everlasting burning? 
And there are many Old Testament passages like Psalm 78, 66 and Jeremiah 23, 40, which refer to eternal shame for the wicked. Psalm 52 verse 5 speaks about God bringing the wicked down to everlasting ruin. Jeremiah 25 verse 9, same thing. If you're going to experience everlasting shame, everlasting room that requires consciousness. If you've been annihilated, how can you have everlasting shame? And why would you be warned about that? John writes that Satan, the Antichrist and the false prophet are thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. But the same fate awaits unbelievers because Jesus in Matthew 25 speaks about the king saying to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed into that eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Then they will go away, Jesus says, to eternal punishment. Revelation 14, 11, the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. There will be no rest day or night for those who worship the beast and its image. Those are people or for anyone who receives the mark of its name. Jesus in Matthew 18 verse 8 spoke of those who are cast into the everlasting fire. Hell, he says, where the fire never goes up. That's Jesus' word. And the fire is not quenched. Why do you need an everlasting fire if those who are thrown into it are exterminated immediately? You could then just put the fire out. It's done its purpose. But it's spoken of as being an everlasting fire, a fire that never goes out, a fire that is not quenched. Jude 7, they serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 9, they will be punished with everlasting destruction. Now, Isaiah also spoke about a fire that will not be quenched and worms that will not die. Isaiah 66, 24, he says, They shall go out and look on the dead bodies of the men who have rebelled against me, for their worm shall not die, their fire shall not be quenched, and they shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. Now, Jesus quoted that, but he quoted it in the context of warning about hell. And so Jesus says, if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out, it is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. He's taking that from Isaiah and he's applying it to people who have died. Now, in both those texts, what Jesus said and Isaiah said, a worm literally means a maggot. And a maggot, we're not talking about a garden worm. A maggot is always associated with dead bodies. But interestingly, it tells us in scripture that the worm will not die. So God question says, taken at face value, this text is one of the most horrific descriptions of what hell is like. The thought of eternal torment, likened to maggots. Eating away at a rotting corpse is undoubtedly ghastly. Hell is so awful that Jesus said, figuratively speaking, it's better to cut off the hand that causes you to sin than to end up in hell. And they go on to say, and I agree with them, that it does not mean that there are literal worms in hell or that there are worms that live forever. Rather, Jesus is teaching the fact of unending suffering in hell. The worm never stops causing torment what's also interesting is that it says their worm it doesn't say the worm it says their worm so it makes it personal identifying the worm as having an owner the source of torment is attached to its own host and so again i want to read this from god questions very interesting i found it's an alternate explanation to literal worm, which I don't think goes against what scripture teaches elsewhere. Some Bible scholars believe the worm refers to a man's conscience. 
Those in hell being completely cut off from God exist with a nagging guilty conscience that like a persistent worm gnaws away at its victim with a remorse that can never be mitigated. No matter what the word worm refers to, the most important thing to be gained from these words of Christ is that we should do everything in our power to escape the horrors of hell. And there is only one thing to that end, receiving Jesus as the Lord of our lives. Hell is spoken of as a place of finality. We used to have a bumper sticker when we were younger that says, hell has no fire escape. And so there's no second chance to change your mind about serving God after you die. There's no purgatory you can go to where your friends can pay some money to get you out early or can pray you into heaven, as some teach. We see when Jesus spoke of this place where the rich man was, he says, we can't come to you even if we want to, and you can't come to us. It's a place of finality. And Hebrews 9 verse 27 says that man is destined to die once and after that to face judgment. You don't come back as false religions teach and get reincarnated and get chance after chance. Man is destined to live once, to die once, and to be judged. So annihilationists say, well, God is too loving to torment his creations forever. And it's true in 1 John 4 verse 16, it says God is love. But you've got to read the whole Bible. And 1 Peter 1 16 says God is holy. And it speaks about God being just. And so as a just God, he will ultimately punish sin that is unconfessed. And there, 2 Thessalonians 1 68 starts off by saying God is just. So God is love, but God is just. And Paul goes on to say he will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is not bluffing. And so, Chuck Colson says, in a sense, the concept of hell gives meaning to our lives. It tells us that the moral choices we make day by day have eternal significance, that our behavior has consequences last into eternity, that God himself takes our choices seriously. The doctrine of hell is not just some dusty theological holdover from the Middle Ages. It has significant social consequences. Without a conviction of ultimate justice, people's sense of moral obligation dissolves and social bonds are broken. Do you really believe that the wicked who die unpunished for their sins will never be punished? That the murderers, that the Hitlers, the Stalins, and any sinner who has committed atrocities, sins against God, will die without punishment? That there's no ultimate justice? And so the torments of hell are attributable not to a defect in God's benevolence, but in our human free will. Because it says that God is a good God doesn't want to see anyone perish. 2 Peter 3 verse 9 says, The Lord is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish. That's not God's perfect plan. But everyone to come to repentance. But he also allows you to control your own destiny. You have a free will you made in the image of God. And despite the fact that God is love and he doesn't want anyone to perish, it also teaches in the Bible that God is just and the wicked will be punished. Jesus spoke of hell as being prepared for the devil and his angels. He didn't say for man and the devil and his angels. So the connotation there, many believe, is that man chooses it, chooses it as his own destiny by rejecting God. You choose hell. It was created for the devil and his angels. If you want to end up there, that's your choice. It's not what God wants. And so as we come to a close, there's only one way to escape hell, and that's not, a, not to enter. And Jesus, who warned the most about hell, is the only one who can save you from hell. 
And so he said in Matthew 16, verse 18, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell, that's Hades, shall not prevail against it. As Christians, as the church, we do not have to go even to the good part of Hades, by the way. The gates of hell or Hades shall not prevail against the church of Jesus Christ. And Jesus made it clear. All his warnings he gave about hell, but he said in John 3, 16 to 17, that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. But you notice, even though God doesn't want the world to perish, there's a condition, whoever believes in him. You need to put your faith and trust in Jesus. That's your part. John 5, 24, Jesus said, Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my words, word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. And so, have you repented of your sin? Have you put your faith in Jesus? God's done his part. He doesn't want you to perish. But you can still, through your own choices, choose that hell is your destiny. And if you haven't, 2 Corinthians 6 verse 2 says, today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow is not promised to you. You've got no guarantee that you'll even see tomorrow, no matter what age you are. And so, my final slide, the choice is yours. You're not saved by your works. It's all done by Jesus, but you have to make the choice. And that's why Jesus said in John 3.36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. But he says, whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. The choice is yours. If you haven't made that decision, I suggest you do it. Not only today, but do it right now. Because as I say, our very breath is a gift from a gracious God who sends his rain and the sun on the righteous and the unrighteousness and gives life and blessings to all of us, whether we admit it or not. Don't presume upon God's grace or presume upon time that you may not have to make right with God. 